Hello, how are you? Hi, Riley. I'm, oh, hold on. Am I, I'm doing really well, and I'm so thrilled <laughs> to be here with you. I was just making sure I wasn't muted, but um, thank you so much for doing this with me. This is like such a treat to get to kick off launch week by chatting with you. It, it really is, and I'm honored to join you. And so to all of you who are watching, welcome to the Barnes & Noble Midday Mystery Virtual Series. I'm Riley Sager, the New York Times bestselling author of seven novels, including the upcoming The Only One Left, which comes at all. <laughs> and it is my great pleasure to be here with the Megan Miranda. Although I always think with Megan the Stallion, you should be like Megan the Miranda. The Miranda. <laughs> and Megan the Miranda is the author, <laughs> New York Times bestselling author of several novels, including All the Missing Girls, the Reese Witherspoon Book Club selection, The Last House Guest, and last year's The Last to Vanish. Her current book, The Only Survivors, comes out tomorrow. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I appreciate it. So this book, when I read it, when I finished it, <laughs> it was about 2 a.m. Okay. Because like I just had to know. I'm like, okay, I have to know. So let's tell our viewers what to expect that will keep them up until 2 a.m. to finish this book. Okay, yeah. So I love that you stayed up till 2 a.m. and I hope it keeps readers up as well, but I apologize for the missing sleep if so. Um, so The Only Survivors is about this group of former classmates who were the only survivors of a tragic accident that happened when they were seniors in high school. Um, when they were seniors, they were on a service trip and their vans went off the road in the mountains during a storm um, into the ravine um, in the Tennessee mountains. And when they finally reached safety seven hours later, there were only nine of them left. They have since made a pact to get together every year around the anniversary in order to check in on one another, keep each other safe, so they claim. And the 10-year anniversary is just approaching, and at this point, they are down to seven survivors, and another one has just gone missing. So the book is narrated over the course of seven days of this reunion in the present, but it's interspersed with the seven hours that changed their lives in the past as well. So it's got both the different timelines of what's happening now and also what happened in the past. Now, what was the... I found that like something sparks an idea. So what was what was the spark for this one and like this this harrowing ordeal that these poor kids went through? Right. So I usually feel like my I come around to an idea in a very roundabout way generally and in this case it was actually like something very concrete that happened and it was such a weird bizarre story in real life that happened on a family vacation and it has nothing to do with like this harrowing accident in the past but it kicked off my brain into thinking about all these what if scenarios so what happened is a few summers ago um, i was on a family vacation visiting my husband's family in puerto rico my husband and daughter were walking on the beach and a phone washed up in the surf at Ooh. their feet. Um, and so they brought it back. It was in one of those like otter box cases. It was cracked. It was obviously dead. There was like sand and water coating it. They brought it back to the condo and they figured, well, we'll see if we can track down the owner. We'll leave it in the sun and see what happens. And immediately I was like, well, this is a horrible idea. Like, obviously this is like evidence of a crime that we have just <laughs> picked up and brought home with us. Undeterred, they managed to turn this phone on, they plugged it in, it came to life, and there was no passcode screen. And I was like, okay, this is like red flag number two immediately. Um, and then they were trying to figure out like who it belonged to, but it kept rebooting. And the only piece of evidence they could find was like a photo, the last photo taken, which was like from the perspective of a jet ski looking out into the ocean, at which point I was like, well, now we've seen the scene of a crime. Like we've turned the phone on, <laughs> someone can track us. The story has a very happy non-criminal ending where they found like the emergency contact number, contacted it from their own phone. And this phone had survived for two weeks in the ocean. It had in been lost water. on vacation oh two weeks in the past. Um, 
And we shipped it back to them and like happy ending. But I got home and could not stop thinking about all these what ifs. Like what if, Mm -hmm. like how would the people who both lost a phone and found a phone be connected? Who is it who's here? And so I started thinking about, okay, what group would it be? Would it be family? Would it be friends? Well, that would be too nice and happy and fun. So I was like, okay, it's going to be a reunion that nobody wants to be at. And that's how I kind of backed my way into this reunion, uh, like a survivor's reunion. And from there, the story goes in a very different direction. But there is a scene early on in the book where the main character, Cassidy, is walking along the beach and a phone washes up in the surf. She's able to bring it back to life. It has no passcode screen. And from there, it takes a completely different turn. But that was the moment that really kicked everything off. That is that is crazy. And I would have been the same way. I would have been veering between like, oh my gosh, this is terrifying. This is this is no good. But also the further writer wheels would have been turning and be like, oh gosh, okay, how do I make this a book? Yes. So I'm and, so glad that you could do that and, and it had a happy ending. Right, right. I mean, I, I like the idea of a mystery in real life that we had to see through, but I was like, danger, danger. I'll do it in fiction instead. Yeah, best of both worlds. Like yes. you, happy ending, you got to, you know, reunite someone with their seriously I know. Crazy strong phone yeah. and got a book out of the deal. So bravo. <laughs> Thank you. But so you, you mentioned Cassidy and she is sort of the, the, the reader's guide through most of this book. Um, why did you pick her to be sort of like the, the narrative focus here? The, Yeah, that's a great question and something I think a lot about when I'm starting a book, especially because there were nine survivors at the heart of this story. So why Cassidy as the narrator? Um, And I feel like I'm really drawn to writing characters who kind of straddle this line between insider and outsider. Um, And Cassidy was not friends with the people in this group. And that's one thing I should say, like these survivors, they were not all friends before this accident. They all had different reasons for being on this trip. Some needed the service hours. Some wanted to be with their friends. Um, Some were part of this volunteer club for a long time. And Cassidy was somebody who was really not a part of this group at all, who survived. And she's also just always been a really keen observer of other people. And so it was a really good way in for me to be able to kind of inhabit her mind as she was observing all these relationships I'm kind of not really sure who she can trust in this house either, because she doesn't really know them as well as they know each other. She sees them once a year and she's not really sure, like, do some of these people see each other throughout the year and do they talk about other things and are there other secrets that I'm not aware of? Um, So she was kind of the voice of how I got into the story. But one thing that I did a little differently in this book that I haven't done before was writing flashbacks from each of the other characters' perspectives, even though they're in third person. Um, it was kind of a really fun way to dip into every one of their heads and experiences too. Yeah, and I, I did, I, I loved, when I got to the first flashback, I was just like, oh, <laughs> this is, and then it, it wasn't from Cassie. I was like, right. oh, hmm. It's different. <laughs> yes, but I, I, I love that, you know, you did make her an outsider and that like, they weren't friends. Cause like you, like, starting the book you sort of think like oh this is kind of like probably not the best comparison but like the big chill like oh they were all so close once upon a time they've drifted but it's like no she barely knows these people and she really didn't know them in high school and it's the sense of guilt like like there's there are reasons like they keep coming together every year and the way you like unspooled it was very very good Thank you. Yeah, it's like I was so interested in this idea that like one event is is bonding this entire group together. They would not be together if it weren't for that. And yet they all have completely different reactions to this one event um, and their lives go in completely different ways. And yet they can't quite escape. Like they keep pulling each other back together. Um, They keep each other safe or they keep each other's secrets. And you kind of unspool everything about each character as you're going yeah it was it was so good now we have a lot of questions (laughs) everyone is like putting their questions in advance which is awesome and so like I'm going to try to sprinkle them through when we you know get to something so several people have asked you know like how do you write a book like how do you like um you know we have Robert J. Mahoney asked with multiple characters of which this book has many 
how do you help readers keep them distinct and memorable? Um, you know, there is, do you have any tips for outlining a new novel? That's from Ashley Switzer. How to okay. keep track of an organizer storyline from Erica Decker. And I remember the first time we met was at the Morristown Festival of Books and we did a panel together. And you said that you did not outline all the missing girls, right. which blew my mind because it was so perfectly plotted. So do you still not outline? I still do not outline. Um, I will say I've come a little closer to like a hybrid type situation because if I go too far and discover something like halfway through that changes the entire trajectory of my book, and then you're sort of like, ooh, I'm going to have to rewrite everything that's come before. So I do try to see like the turning points before I start. Um, I might not know the plot. I might not know who did it, but I have an idea of where my, I have an idea, a very solid idea of who my main character is, the secrets maybe they're keeping and where I'd like them to be at the end. Um, and I love all of these questions. I feel like I also want to ask you this as well, but to get to the one about characters, um, that to me was actually almost more outlining than the plot itself, because there was a large cast of characters. And this idea, like, like the question asked, like, how do you try to differentiate them and keep them straight and have them each have like this secret or this past that they're kind of holding on to. And so when I was writing this book, I tried to really hone in on those distinctions of each character, like what their job is, even like Grace is a therapist. And that kind of influences the way that she speaks all the time. She kind of has her therapist voice. Um, and each character kind of pulls on a little bit of like this distinction for them. But since we were coming at the characters through Cassidy's point of view, one of the things I wanted to do was show them how she kind of sees them. And she has been really traumatized with this event in the past. And one of the things that she always does, it's sort of a coping mechanism when she's in a room is she thinks, who would I save? If there was a disaster, who would I save and why? And so as she's meeting or seeing each character for the first time, she kind of runs through that. She's like, Brody, there's a car seat in his car. He's a new father. Reasons to save Brody. He's a new father. People would miss him. And she kind of introduces each character that way. Um, you know, Oliver, reasons to save him. This house that they stay at alone. She gets to Joshua and she's like, can't think of a reason to save him. But it's kind of like... <laughs> The way that you can kind of see her interaction with each character. But when I'm writing the story, um, I don't have big outline boards. I do keep an Excel spreadsheet up as I'm writing. And I discover things as I go. So it's not just the plot, but it'll be like, these are the clues or the discoveries that have happened in this section. These are the reveals or, or the things that shift a reader's perspective that, that they discover in this section. Um, and once I have the idea for the structure, that really almost provides like a plot backbone for me. So I knew very early on it was going to be seven days in the present and then seven hours in the past. And it became a little bit of a puzzle, like which character is going to show which hour and why. Um, and so it's it's sort of like an evolving outline as I'm writing. And I know you're kind of the opposite, right? Like you like to do your work up front. I feel like you either do all the work up front or it like happens in revision or like in the middle, but we all get to the same place at the end. Like the time is either before or after. Yeah, I, I generally outline and, you know, keep it all in mind, I don't have an Excel. I have, I'm so disorganized. I just have like this Word document with just like random notes all over the place. But I, I do like sort of keep track of like where, because if if I don't do that, I just look at the screen, <laughs> this blank screen and be like, I don't know what I'm going to, I don't know. So yeah, it's, it's, so it's very interesting how like we have completely different approaches and yet we do end up at the same place. Yeah. For me, I feel like the thing that brings me to the screen is this idea of I don't know what happens. And so it's kind of like an excitement of I wonder what happens next. I'm going to write to find out. Um, and sometimes if I know, I'll procrastinate even more. Like, because I'm like, oh, oh okay. I know what happens. I'm going to be able to write it because I know what happens, but then I just keep procrastinating it. See, mine is the obvious. I'm just like, I'll figure it out. I'm going to go like read or watch TV now and it'll, it'll, it'll happen. 
but so speaking of care and one i loved the cassidy reasons for saving people that was one of the things where i was like oh this makes me jealous because this is such a great character trait and it has the added benefit of like really summing up the other characters and like a sentence basically yeah. why this person is worthy or not worthy of saving in her eyes yes thank but you but we have um there is a question about ah yes this is from Catherine goldberg which one of your characters was the most fun or challenging to write Ooh, oh that's a great question they were all challenging for different reasons um, because each of these characters has kind of been very traumatized by this event in the past and has has kind of come up with their own coping mechanisms for it. Um, I always feel, feel most attached to the main character because I'm writing from their point of view. Um, another character, I'll say I, I enjoyed writing this character, even though my main character hates them, um, is Joshua. And I think, so here's a secret. When I was writing Such a Quiet Place, I had too many characters that didn't make it into the book. And one of the characters was named Joshua. And he was kind of a jerk. And he said things sarcastically. And when it got to revision time, you know, my editor asked, is is he a necessary character? And I was like, well, he has a couple good lines, but like, no, he's not. And he had to, he like died the death of the manuscript. And when I was writing this book, I was like, you know, who would come in really handy in this book, a character just like Joshua. And he he's very different, but he kind of had those same personality traits. And in this book, I got to explore why he has them. Um, so that was kind of a, a fun process, um, even though like Cassidy can't stand him. He was he was somebody I enjoyed writing. Um, I think I probably, um, Amaya was a character that I found difficult to write because she had changed so much from who she was in the past to who she is now in the present. She was the group organizer. She was so type A and so in charge of everything. And in the present, she has taken a very different path in life than what she had intended. And she also goes missing very early on. And so it becomes sort of a, a, a she was sort of a mystery for Cassidy. And so a puzzle for me to explore as well. And a, a puzzle for the reader, because I, I do like how when you, you we get glimpses of all these characters as teenagers after this horrible crash and we can see just like the stark contrast sometimes between how they are today and it's it it reminded me a little bit of um yellow jackets mm -hmm. except your book does not have cannibalism right so, thank god <laughs> and seven hours is Right. They only survived seven show. hours. Yes. Yeah. But there is like that very sort of like yellow jackets feel of like, oh, this is what happened. And boy, did it mess some of them up. And here we go today. And these are, you know, they're still processing all of this. Yeah. And some of them have, you know, stayed very close to where this event occurred. And, and they have kind of continued on that quest of like, what they were doing that night even. Um, and some of them have gone like as far as they can away and have completely changed the trajectory of their lives, both for better and worse. There are some characters who kind of make huge changes that I think you would not, like if they came to a high school reunion, you're like, really? That's what that guy's doing now? Um, so it was really interesting to, it was, it was fun to kind of explore that like before and after. And then the whys, you kind of get a, a sense of the whys as you read. Now we continue with questions about like the, the writing process. Yes. So um, we have like from Laurie Johnson, um, how do you pace yourself while writing a new novel? And what does your writing schedule typically look like? And there are, you know, many others like that. Um, yeah. Sorry if I'm missing some of your questions. <laughs> there were a lot of duplicates and so, but yeah, so what is, what is the typical writing day for Megan D. Miranda? <laughs> so it varies a little bit. Um, I, I try not to have a set word count, but I think it's because I don't do plotting up front. So if I were to set myself a word count and I've made this mistake in the past where I was like, I have to write 3000 words a day, and then I'm going to finish this draft at a certain point. 
I'm writing words, whether they're the, not the right words or they are the right words. And I would plot myself into the wrong direction. And so sometimes progress for me is like deleting a chapter or realizing I went the wrong way. And I don't want to discount that and think that that has not been a successful day. Like anytime I figure something out in my manuscript is a successful day to me. Um, so I usually, it usually takes me much longer because of this to write the first 50 to 75 pages of my book because I'm figuring out who these characters are. I'm throwing them into situations, figuring out what character relationships are like. Um, I'm learning like what secrets they might be keeping. And I do a lot of revising as I go in that part. Once I reach like the halfway point, hopefully when I'm at halfway, I see where I'm going to the end and it's not always the case. But hopefully when you reach halfway, you're like, okay, I know where I'm going. And then it becomes a little bit frantic. Like my first draft gets a little frantic because once I see it, I want to get there. Um, but I feel like I, it almost helps me like I'm channeling that energy um, as the book kind of picks up steam too, because the danger is usually closing in at this point. And then I go back and, and have to do a lot of revising. So depending where I am in the process is what dictates what my day is like. I mean, sometimes I'm more like exploring the idea, writing some scenes that might not be in order, doing research. Um, sometimes I am, you know, if you're if I'm editing, I have much more set goals. Like I'm going to get through five chapters because at that point, I feel like I have a solid something I can work with and I know what the end product should be. Um, and then I get much more structured. Now, what about you? Are you very structured because you do the plotting up front? I'm super I, it, it usually, it, you're right. Like it takes like those first hundred pages are just the worst <laughs> yes. because you just feel like you're spinning your wheels and not accomplishing anything. And I love the last hundred pages. Yes, Those fly by so quickly where it's just like, you're, it's, it's amazing how like you could like, right like the last hundred pages like I think I've done it once in like three weeks where it's like oh I'm done because yes. you just want to get there like because it's yes. all exciting to you and like the momentum's building and you see the finish line yeah and like it's like I think like marathon runners they see that finish line and they just start running faster because they want to get there yes and every time I'm in like the beginning of a book I'm like how do I write a book again like how do I do I've kind of, and then when you get to the halfway and you're like, oh, it's all coming together. It's like so exciting. And so then it just, yeah, it feels like everything is cruising from that point on. And isn't it ridiculous? Like we've written like so many books between us and every time, every time. I sit down like that, it's like, how do you do this? Yes. Done, how, and it's like, it's like all, everything you've learned <laughs> in your previous books, you just completely, it's gone. And you're like, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Yes. You're like, surely when I sit down this time, it's all going to come naturally to me and a book will just emerge. No, never. It's all different. So we have one about, well, actually, here's a good one. This is from Christa, Crystal Borisos. Okay. What drives your writing more? Writing a book that you think your audience fans will love or writing a story you want to tell? Oh, that's such a great question. And I feel like ideally the answer is both. Um, I don't think I could write a book that was not the story I wanted to tell, though, or, or was not kind of something that I felt like I wanted to see through, um, like who's the journey this main character is on. So I think when I'm writing a first draft, I try not to think about any perspectives from the outside until I reach the end because I'm trying to stay true to that character's story and journey. Um, I hope the things that I love about my writing and the stories are also the things that an audience loves. I feel like there's a lot of things that I come back to um, in a lot of my books. Like I love this idea of setting as character and the past returning and like the mysteries, not only, you know, on the surface, but inside the, all the characters that you're unwinding. Um, so, and, and, you know, the truth is like, there's always, differing opinions on what people, what some people like and what others don't like. So I think at the heart, I try to stay true to the story that I want to tell. Um, and I think that I found that a lot of the stories I tell are, are of a similar type. And so my hope is that, you know, the audience that 
has already found my books is also going to enjoy the new ones I'm writing. What about you? What are your thoughts on that? I try, I mean, I, it, it does, like, I do always keep the reader in mind mm -hmm. because they're the ones buying our books and we yeah. appreciate it so much. So you don't want to alienate them too right. much. But at the same time, there are like, you know, with The House Across the Lake, my last book, things got a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's like no and spoilers. I, can, yeah. Right. And I and, and I saw some I saw some pushback from some readers, like, how could you do this? And it's like, I just I just needed to, you know? Yeah. Like I just I'm it just you. was I had to. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it was this creative risk that I'm like, and I knew like when I was writing it, like some people are not gonna be on board with this. Oh boy. <laughs> but it was just something that I felt I had to to do. Well, and I feel like even if there were different elements, it still feels very much like a Riley Sager book. You know, it's it's all the things that a reader loves about your writing and the setting and you know the characters. It still feels very much as part of you know everything you're writing. Yeah, and like you you have the like that same like there is a Megan Miranda style. Right. And like I think that you could do something as crazy as the house across the lake. Like what like and yeah. like it still be cohesive with your other work because you do have like that style. Yeah. And one of the things you mentioned was setting as character. Yeah. And we do have a question that I'm trying to find out where it is. So you guys had so many great questions and I'm trying <laughs> to amazing. Out. Thank you. Yes. Um, yes, here we go. From Dalton Height. Why are your novels so centered around setting from small gated community to beaches? How does that set you apart? And um, I'm going to add, a, add on to that. This is the Outer Banks. So why did you pick the Outer Banks? For yes. um, I love setting. I feel like this is also something that is similar in both of our books. Like they're so like setting feels like character. Um, and to me, setting is one of the most important things when I'm writing a book, I love the idea that a setting is a character, that it has its own history, that every character has its own relationship with it. But mostly I love the the idea that it's like the duality of a setting. So, you know, these places that these characters are in, for the most part are beautiful places and, and they love these places. And I love these places. Like my husband jokes that my brand is now like, take places we love and turn them creepy. Like <laughs> I, I ruined hiking last year and now I'm ruining the beach. So You really did ruin hiking. Yeah. For me. Yeah. Sorry. So, it's okay. but I, I forgive you. But it's like things I love to do. And I think it's things these characters love to do and they're, they're places of peace. Um, and yet when things go wrong, there are things that can be like turned against you and all these things that were beautiful. You're like, how are they terrifying instead? Um, and so I, I, I'm drawn to small towns. I love small town settings. Um, I love the dynamic within small towns and everyone's relationship with the place. Um, and when I was deciding on a place for this book, I knew it was going to be on the beach because of this phone situation that had happened to me. And I decided on the Outer Banks. Um, I live in North Carolina, but to get to the Outer Banks, you have to take like a series of bridges to get there. Um, and it's like stunningly beautiful. Like the, the sand, the dunes are on both sides of the road. You've got the Atlantic Ocean on one side and then the sound on the other. So you can see a sunrise and a sunset and it should be so peaceful and beautiful. And yet... It can also be a place where these characters quickly become trapped and isolated. Like that isolation, there's a pro to it, but then there's also a con. Um, and, you know, I after I went to the Outer Banks to do some research, I left and like two days later, they shut down the road because the high tide um, was coming over onto the main highway, which is like a very narrow, it's not like a, a big highway. Um, so all these things that these characters love, like they're there because it's far from the site of the accident. They're surrounded on all sides by the endless deep. It should be protected, but instead now it becomes a trap um, as things turn against them and a storm is coming. Dun, dun, dun. dun, dun, dun. Yeah, and like as someone who has spent several childhood vacations at the Outer Banks. Like you, you captured it perfectly. Like the, 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 the beach houses with their multi-tiered porches yes. and everything. And the idea of like, it's, there are lots of people there and houses there, but there's also this weird sense of isolation where yeah. like, it's, 
I remember that from being there as a you know kid, just being like, yeah, there's a house over there. I don't know if anyone's in it. Like right. we don't know. And yeah, it's it's and you get to meet some people, some some yeah. neighbors who yes. might be shady or not. And that's also a really good thing where you like expand. It's not just the people in the house. There right. could be a threat coming from outside this beach house. Threats can come from everywhere. Threats can come from nature too. And I love like all of those things in play at once, which I think is why I'm drawn to settings because, you know, they're, they are characters, they can cause damage. Um, and I think setting is so much about a character's perspective too. Like when you're happy um, and you're on vacation, like these things are beautiful. And when you're afraid, everything can take on this element of danger and, you know, trying to channel it that way instead is, is kind of a fun exercise, but that's why I take separate research trips, like without my children, because when I go to the beach with my kids, I'm like, Oh, happy fun time. I don't want to be thinking about all the terrifying things. And I'm going to <laughs> it's... Yes. And so we have a question from Michael Chan, how much time, can, how, how time consuming is completing research for a novel and then fact checking what you found. And on top of that, there's a great question from um, oh, I can't find it now, but it was, I'm sorry, whoever wrote it, it was um, during your research, what is the weirdest thing you've had to Google? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so in terms of research, it depends for each book, the things that I have to be researching. Um, I think I might have mentioned this for a, a prior book where, you know, when I was writing Last House Guest, which is set up in Maine, um, I went down the rabbit hole on like lobstering, like the industry of lobstering. I went out on a lobster boat in Maine because I thought a character was going to have like, you know, that was the industry they were in. Lobstering is mentioned zero times in that book. Like it just kind of depends, but I feel like I got a really good. <laughs> I was just going to say, I'm like, no. I don't remember any no. lobstering in that book at all. Did not make it None. into the book. No, but I feel like it kind of gave me a sense of like the place. But research can be very different things. I mean, I feel like there's the research where I'm calling up people in because I'm writing. You know, a lot of my books do have an element of legal or law enforcement in it. Um, I call up contacts that I know. Um, there's an ex-detective I am familiar with, and I have some lawyers in the family. And so I'm, I always kind of am running scenarios by them to make sure that the ideas hold water. Um, and if there are things that like maybe aren't exactly how they would happen, like I'm making those decisions knowingly for, you know, Maybe something's not going to take this long to go to trial because that would pull out the book a little too long. Right. So sometimes you do make those choices. Um, but a lot of my research comes from going to a place. I, I feel like that really helps me um, embrace the setting. So when I was writing this book, I took two different research trips. One, I did the drive through the Tennessee mountains. Um, and like, I'm there with my daughter. We were on our way to Nashville. And I was like, what, does it look safe over there? Is there a guardrail <laughs> over there? Like, but, you know, it's just kind of inhabiting like the spaces um, and making sure like the thing I wanted to make sure the drive was accurate, um, like counting the tunnels as I'm going and making sure those details are right in the book. Um, when I went over to the Outer Banks, I went with the intention of like, I'm just doing research for this book. And so my husband came with me and, you know, we took some pictures during the day. And then like at 9 PM, I was like, okay, now, now let's go check things out. And he's like, well, we can't see anything. Like, exactly. We have to go out to the beach now. Like I write a thriller. These things happen at night. We need to like, know how far can I see on the beach at night with my flashlight without, and is it creepy? Like the answer is yes. I think the term my husband used was feels a little bit murdery out here. And then I had this like <laughs> horrifying re like revelation as I was doing this, that like I'm the person creeping past these people's houses, like through the dune paths at night as I'm trying to do research. Like I'm the person turning my flashlight on and off on the beach. And I'm like, what if someone's watching me out here? And they're like, what is that creepy person doing out there? So a lot of my research is like centered on going to places um, or researching what people do for a living and trying to learn as much about that as I can as well. Um, in terms of Googling, oh gosh, I'm like scared what my internet search history is like, honestly, I'm sure it's the same for yeah. you. Um, and there'll be like 
details of things that you want to fact check and you're like you're when you want to say at the end like it's for a book it's for a book um I was writing a book um this it's one of my older young adult books but it was um basically like a home invasion type story and I did so much research on like how to breach the perimeter of someone's house like these are not things that I want someone to pull up in my search history yeah what like about anytime, you? What it, anytime yeah. I like I google like poisoning or you know like how long does it take a body to decompose in the water or things like that where it's just like we're like this is just weird I know and, and someone somewhere is just like there's some person at Google who is going to be flagged at one day and just put round up <laughs> there's going to be some roundup and we'll all like see each other like and be like oh hey it's all the thriller writers in a line <laughs> yeah and I'll just be like it's it's for it's for research purposes mm -hmm. really so here's a good one. Um, when did your love for reading begin? Ooh. Oh, I, that is from Gina Ritchie. That's a great question. And I, I feel like I've, I can't even remember because I've been like a lifelong reader. Um, and I think, so when I was growing up, my mom used to take me every Thursday, which was her day off to the library. So every Thursday we went to the library, I was free to just go through the stacks, take out as many books as I wanted. And I feel like even from an early age, I was drawn to the mysteries and like started with Nancy Drew. Middle school, suddenly I was like Edgar Allan Poe appealed to me. It was a weird transition, but I always was drawn to these like questions of like, you know, the mysteries inside people. Um, I've just even like, I've had several different careers before I was a writer. Um, I wanted to write when I was younger, but I didn't really know the path to becoming a writer. And I let it go after college for um, about a decade. But the one constant in my life, even when I was working in biotech, I was a high school science teacher. I was always like consuming books on just a massive scale. It's it's always been something I've loved. It's something that um, my family loves. Like my mom was a big reader. My grandparents were big readers. So I, I just feel like it was something I feel very fortunate that I grew up kind of with that. Like I had, my mom had stacks of mystery books in our house too. What about you? Same. Yeah. Like <laughs> just, just be like, just being, I think if you ask writers, like nine out of 10 of us would be like, yeah, our, our parents were big readers and we just picked it up and yeah. we just happened to like the creepier murdery <laughs> type things more. But so is there, is there, one particular book that like made you think this is the genre I want to write in there well it's interesting because I didn't start in adult thrillers I started with young adult yeah, yeah. suspense but I was always drawn to like um you know I, but I feel like that kind of incorporated my backgrounds that I I had like these weird science ideas that came from my background of biology and then I had been teaching um, in a high school setting. And so the first books I wrote were like these suspense novels that had this weird science angle to them. And they were set in the world of high school. And um, one of the books I was given by a teacher in high school was Michael, Cri Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park, which mm -hmm. for me was kind of the book that it's like, oh, this teacher knew me so well and was like, this is going to appeal to everything you love about stories like this science fiction, these ethical questions, these like what's possible and also like action, mystery, suspense. Dinosaur um, eating people. Yeah. And dinosaurs. Like who doesn't love dinosaurs? Yes. Um, so and my books are nothing like that. But I feel like that was a book that I really remember changing my idea of like, oh, hold on, like what kind of stories um, could I tell? And then um, right before, you know, I was reading a lot of YA before I started writing it um, and John Green's Looking for Alaska um, and uh, Mary Pearson's The Adoration of Jenna Fox. Both of those books brought me right back to those moments of high school where I was like, uh, there's something like universal at the heart here that really just grabbed at me and spoke to me. And so those kind of inspired me to write young adult first. Um, I was also a huge suspense reader, like, you know, Gillian Flynn, Megan Abbott, um, Harlan Coben. These are all, you know, some of my favorite authors that have 
inspire me to want to write stories like this as well. But I think also writing young adult stories inspired me to write adult because you have these characters that at the end, you're like, I hope they're okay. And then you think about them years later, like, well, how are they doing now? And I feel like that is a theme at a lot of my adult thrillers. It's like the past has returned and how are they dealing with it now in the future? Well, and that's like, with the only survivors is there there is it, yeah. if you had just kept it in the past like it could have been like the survival tale of teens in the wilderness and this horrible accident yeah and so there is that aspect of like this is they had a happy happy ending back then and right. this is the 10 years later how has it impacted them or not now and that was kind of the whole exploration of this book yeah and this kind of like, I just see a question, Bridget DeWald asked, like, what do you love most about the world of mystery and suspense and darkness? And I think you, you covered that. I do, yeah. And I, I also think like, I know we get like, we're talking about like the dark stuff, but for me, it's, it's also kind of the journey of making it through the other side. Like that is where I'm trying to get these characters to is, you know, and I was a kid who was like afraid of everything. And so I'm like, why am I drawn to these stories that are like terrifying? But I think it's because you're taking the journey through and you're making it through the other side and seeing what these characters are capable of. So I think there's that flip side to it as well. Um, here's a good one. This is from Jessica DeLillo. What is the best advice you have ever received? Oh, ooh, like in writing or in like in life? Let's just, well, um, up to you. Let's, okay. do, let's do life. We talked about writing. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, well, maybe this goes both ways. So um, a great piece of advice I was given, and it was actually before I started writing, but I've been talking about wanting to write, was kind of like this, somebody had said like, well, why not now? And it seems like such a simple thing, but that piece of advice has really stuck with me. Um, and not in terms of, well, I'm going to do it right this second, but this idea of, you're right, I've been talking about wanting to do it. There's never a good time. Like if I want to make this my career, I need to treat it like my career. And it like lit something in me where I started writing right away and kind of carved out like, I'm going to write, I'm going to finish something and get to the end. And I wrote every night. My kids were like one and three and I had blackout curtains for them. So they could go to bed at like 6.30, <laughs> but I could, they didn't nap at that point, but I wrote every night. And I think about that, not just for like that career transition, but when I'm tackling something writing, like all the missing girls for me, like was my first adult book. And I had it in my mind for a while that it was this big idea and I didn't know if I could tackle it. And it was like, well, why not? Why not now? Why not try it now and see? And yes, it took me several years of, you know, trial and error, but um, if I don't start, then I'm not going to ever reach the point that I would, you know, like to be at that point. So it was just something very simple that was said to me. That's really stuck with me. What about look, you? Look, some people wrote some Oh, books in the it's questions. And so let's get to, I think we have time for one of those. Um, let's see. How about, this is from Carrie Love. Hi, Megan. I love all of your books. Which one is your favorite or the one that means the most to you? Sometimes you I can answer like, that. It's hard to answer. I know it's very hard. And I, I feel like sometimes it's like, which child and you're like depends on the day but no like it's you know there I I feel like the book that I just finished is always my favorite at that time because I've just spent at least a year with these characters kind of completely immersed in their lives um so right now I would say it's the only survivors however there are books that I find stick with me for a long time that I think about years later. And I've kind of correlated it to realize that it's the books that I spent the longest doing. And because of that, it's the books that I've spent the longest time with these characters um, and thinking about. And I, I mentioned All the Missing Girls. Like, that's a book that I've been thinking about. It was my second book idea. It was my sixth published novel. So it was this idea that I couldn't let go of. I thought about the characters so much. I would start and start, stop and start and stop. And when I reached the end of that first draft, it was one of like, I still consider it one of the highlights of my career. Like it was a very 
quiet highlight. I was alone on my couch with the laptop, but it was like, oh my gosh, I finished this book that I had been living in my head for so long. Um, so because of that, I still do think about these characters, you know, years later and, and wonder how they're doing. So that's, that's had a large impact on me. The writing of that book also changed me as a writer, kind of encouraged me to take more risks. Well, would you ever write a sequel to one of your books? I always say no, but then like, I do think about them sometimes, but I think like, because I don't write procedurals, um, it's not like a detective who's getting a new case. So I always think to myself, well, if I, if I were to do a sequel, I'd have to put these characters back into a horrible situation because I write thrillers. Yeah. So there, you know, because of that, um, I'm not sure, but I love the idea of like, you know, finding little like Easter eggs, like I've seen in, in some of your books, like from other, you know, things that kind of cross over. So I don't know. I, I feel like, I, I don't think I would do a sequel, but we'll see if there's like pieces of other worlds that, that make it in. So one last question from me and okay. So you have the only survivors. Yeah. I have the only one left. Yeah. We have to assure readers that we did not do this on purpose. We did not coordinate outfits. It's amazing. Like it, was, it was just, it was just a complete accidental thing. I know. But what, what goes into choosing a title? Yeah. So it's wild because like, I feel like I love that these were all happening behind the scenes. And then they both kind of went up right around the same time. Around the same time. And it just amazing. was like, only yeah. is the hot title word of the year. Yes. You have to make it. Yes. Um, so, you know, for me, it's usually not the first thing I come up with. It's usually the last thing and it's conversation after we write the book. Um, I, I think I had called this book when I pitched the book, we kept calling it the survivor's book. It's, it's about this group of survivors. So I'd always just called it the survivor's book draft one. Um, and you know, there's a, a, part, there's a line in the book that talks about, you know, who they are. And, and I always think about the characters when we're thinking of the title. Um, for me, that's what helps focus it. And so it was very clear, like they say, like, we are the only survivors. Um, and now, like, they're getting fewer and fewer. So it seemed like it it worked in more than one way. You know, they were known as the only survivors. And now 10 years later, well, now this group is the only survivors. How about you? Is it something you know right away? No, not like only only the House Across the Lake and Final okay. Girls were like yeah. every other title was just like, because there are marketing concerns to deal with and right. like things like, so it is, it, it's weird. Like titling is, is very strange because it can just, yeah, the titles I want, usually my publisher or, <laughs> or yes. my editor is like, that's not going to sell. <laughs> so something else, please. And so that we go through it for like a long time sometimes. But yeah. I think that you always land on what the book was meant to be called. I think eventually. so. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I believe that is all the time we have. Do you have anything you would like to add? I would just like to add that this is my current read right now and I am obsessed and now it is my <laughs> launch week treat to myself that I'm bringing with me so thank you and I always love chatting with you and looking forward to your books every summer is one of the highlights of like the new Riley Sager is going to be my summer beach read so I'm so excited for this to be out and thank you so much to everyone for joining us the wonderful questions Barnes and Noble for hosting us and Riley it's always the best to chat with yes, you yes this was like, it was Absolute pleasure and congratulations on another phenomenal book. Thank you. And I, yeah, it's just, you, you keep hitting out of the park every single summer. And this, well, it's not even summer. This is, this is like an early gift. It's like a <laughs> spring bonus for us. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, the Only Survivors will be in stores tomorrow. You can order it now from bnn.com. And those of you who bought a ticket with a signed book plate, a copy of the signed book plate, those will be coming in about eight to 10 business days. So thank you all so much. Thank you for the great questions. Thank you, Megan, for a great book and for a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.